and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our PLC at Work Under the Spotlight webinar. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Gavin Grift and I'm here to host this webinar and I'm delighted to have with me Janelle Dickman and Colin Sloper uh, to speak about their experiences through this transformational work for schools. So um, welcome along wherever you might be, whenever you are watching this. We hope that you get uh, a lot out of our, our session, our webinar here today. So just a quick introduction, I want to let you know who our webinar guests are. I just mentioned their names. Um, I've worked with both of them over quite a period of time in different guises. Um, and the reason why I asked them to come and join us and to share their wealth of expertise and knowledge was because of the ways in which they've showed real leadership through the PLC process for the schools that they work in and actually for other schools as well. Um, so I want to welcome Janelle and Colin here. And perhaps before we go forward, um, if you'd both like to just say hi and maybe just tell us a little bit of, um, about what you're doing now um, and then we'll move forward. Sure. Janelle. Hi there. Um, thanks for having me, Gavin. Appreciate being part of this. It's really exciting work. Um, yes, I have been heavily involved in this work for, for many years now, um, particularly in, well, initially, I guess, in a very big high school on the Gold Coast in Queensland. Um, for about seven years, getting the whole PLC philosophy community established, um, which was incredibly rewarding work. I have now moved to another school pretty much across the highway, um, Pacific Pines, and I'm basically doing the same thing all over again because I'm, I believe that much in it. And I've also been really fortunate this year to work with um, Hawker Brownlow and do some coaching in some schools around New South Wales, which has been incredibly rewarding work too. It's giving me more of a global look at um, how this work is going in other schools. So that's been great. Thank you. Awesome words. Well, lovely to reconnect with you and have you here. Colin, a bit about what you're up to and, and your connection. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gavin. I've been in uh, working in education for the about last uh, 38 years. And during that time, I've been an educator, leader and principal of uh, government schools down here in Victoria. And the last phase of my career has been really working as a consultant and co-author on a number of works around PLC. So collaborative teams at work, transformative collaboration, and uh, a couple of the books that I've uh, been heavily involved with and um, really working with schools across Australia in terms of uh, extending and deepening their understanding of the uh, PLC at work process. Awesome, thank you. And probably trying to retire, but no one will let you. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a whole other point, right? Okay, so I guess for all of us to some degree, um, this book has been transformational. I know that I first came across it, maybe the first edition or potentially it was the second edition uh, back in 2010, I believe it was at the time. Um, so what we're going to do is take a deep dive, if you like, into the core concepts from your experiences in order to help people um, provide tips, give them insights and some thinking about the potential of this work. And uh, if people are on this journey, what they might be able to do to, to continue that journey. So of course, I'm talking about learning by doing by Rick and Becky DeFore, um, Bob Eaker, Thomas Meany, Mike Mados, and Colin, of course, we had the great privilege to be able to contextualize this book for, for an Australian perspective. Um, so just to, before we go any further, just on that book, um, both of you, just your, your connection to that book, was that a real game changer for you both? Well, absolutely for me, definitely. It was definitely the starting um, Bible, I guess, in the work that we began at Helensvale and in getting this at ground level and having the structures and the right, the right work, I suppose, at play. And also for me, likewise, I can remember um, in the very early days of um, opening one of the new schools that I was the principal of in Victoria, I had the pleasure of... Um, attending a session that uh, Rick and Re Rebecca DeFore ran and everything that they were saying and that's contained in the book just made sense. It resonated with me in terms of the challenges that we faced in uh, schools in Australia and the practical solutions they were suggesting that would overcome those uh, issues that I dealt with as a teacher, leader and principal of uh, schools in Victoria. 
Okay, so I think we can all agree that for, for, for all of us, it was, I guess, not just a starting point, but more than that, laid the foundation and continues to provide the support as we support other schools. So around this notion of what a PLC at work is, I know one of the things that I, I guess each of us will have seen is this term professional learning community is not new. It's not new in our profession. Uh, it's used right across the, the country. It's used in the independent sector, the, the Catholic system, the government systems within each state. Yet it does have different connotations and different meanings in different settings and different contexts. So I thought it might be good just to talk a little bit about this kind of notion of clarity precedes competence if we look at this uh, with this quote from Mike Smoker around this. Because I think for us, the definition of this PLC at work process is so important. Now in the work, if we look at literally it from learning by doing, uh, the way they define it is an ongoing process in which educators work collaboratively in recurring cycles of collective inquiry and action research to achieve better results for the students that they serve. So I'll put this definition back up for you both in a moment, but I'm just wondering on your thoughts here, given the importance of having clarity around something that we're trying to operationalize and given the multitude of definitions that exists for a professional learning community, you know, what is it about this definition um, of the PLC at work process, which is, is, is the fabric really of that, that learning by doing pieces many, as, as alongside of many other um, books. How have you lived this definition, you know, in your schools when you think about um, the schools that you've led, whether that be the schools you're supporting in your leadership um, as, as an associate and as a coach, or whether that be more directly in your, your leadership um, in administration in schools, how have you lived this definition? What really sticks out for you and what are the things that comes to mind when I ask you that? I might start with you, Colin, this time, and then we'll go across to Janelle. And I think, um, Gavin, what you're saying there, when we came to um, exploring at my school the um, concept of professional learning communities, it wasn't necessarily a buzzword at that time. It certainly has become and in many ways lost a lot of its meaning. And I think when I reflect on um, the work learning by doing, um, I think the title captures the whole essence of the process. The fact that we want educators in schools to be continually learning about their craft, their teaching practice, and there's certain ways we do that that are elaborated, obviously, in the book. But the crux to me in my school, I think, in making sense of what a professional learning community was, was that clarity around what it actually was that the work of schools is meant to be regardless of what you label it the fact that if we can get teachers working collaboratively if they're understanding that by doing that work they're actually involved in enhancing and increasing their teaching competence then that leads to those direct improvements in student learning that we're aiming for I think in many ways to me, um, when I read Learning by Doing and had my leadership team initially read Learning by Doing, it was those aha moments that this just makes sense. It wasn't foreign. It was expressed in very simple terms that moved us back to a core understanding about what our purpose was. And I think in many ways in a lot of um, uh, educational districts and uh um, departments that I've worked across, we're bombarded with so much other stuff, initiatives that come and go, and we've all been, you know, almost beaten up to death in terms of initiatives that we could list up, which would be, you know, in my career, thousands. When we looked at the work of learning by doing, it stripped it back to what was the core purpose of the work we we're doing, which was obviously to improve student learning. And the pathway to do that was to focus on continually to improve teaching practice. That's what gelled to me around that the whole book, the whole notion of professional learning communities, learning by doing, and it encapsulated in that very concise but powerful definition you've got on the screen there. So it was the operationalizing of the key terms that sit here and the meaning behind these and the discussions around how to make them happen that was almost more important than the label of, you know, PLC itself. And um, second thing, just before I pass it over to Janelle for her thoughts is I'm not sure thousands is accurate. You're not quite that old. You're only semi-retired. But anyway, that's fine. Um, okay. So Janelle, you know, what, what's resonating with you, you know, with, from what Colin said and, of course, um, from the definition in regards to this? I think for me it's very 
very important to come back, we'll continually revisit this and revisit it with um, incredible intention because it's very easy to chuck teachers into teams. It's really easy to, like, it's actually relatively easy, easy to find the time in the timetable if you really want to. You can go in and you can create this space for these teachers to meet and then everybody thinks, oh, unreal, now the kids' students, uh, the students' results are going to improve. What I've found time and time again is that it's just so important that um, we're really, really concerned about that the teachers are doing the right work. So keeping on coming back to these recurring cycles of collective inquiry and action research, which is the, the meat of that for me, um, has been pivotal in how far our teams and how high performing our teams have been. So that working collaboratively doesn't mean you know, coordinating together and doing something together. It doesn't mean cooperating together. It's been really, really pivotal to the work too is that our teachers understand what collaboration actually means and what is the difference between collaboration and cooperation. You know, in that term, collaboration, you know, that, that's so widely used, I guess. So the results will come, I think, but boy, oh boy, you've got to be really clear around what collaboration is and what the right work of those teams is. And so therefore clarity on that is on that definition for, for us, you know, in, at ground level has been absolutely essential. Okay, so it's developing that sort of deeper understanding of what each of these things mean. Yeah, um, but it's really also, good, isn't it? to chuck it off on the PowerPoint, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yes, like, yes, you yes. You chuck it off at the beginning, and, and I see, you know, in the schools I've been coaching, they do this a lot. They just they, they preface it with everything, which is really important, but not mm -hmm. unless you've actually got to the guts of what it actually is to begin with. Yeah. And I think sometimes you've got to go, you know, uh, slower on the corners, don't you, to go faster on the straights? And going slower on the corners for us was really pulling that apart around yep. what that actually meant. Okay. And I guess that's the point too about before and you mentioned and then socialising that by revisiting it and making sure that it's, you know, not something we take for granted, if you like, we continue to revisit it because of its importance to our, our evolving understanding of this work. Yeah. And usually if the things start to fall apart, you can come back to this definition. Or this, and I find if you pull it apart and actually become reflective, you can say, well, where have we crashed and burned? Aha, look at the def. Let's go back to the purpose yeah. and the why. And now we can see where we've gone wrong. Okay, great. Thank you. So it's a bit of an anchor as well. Uh, in the work that we do. All right. So we've explored this question. We know the PLC process is, is, you know, includes this really powerful definition that's offered to us and it has been helping to transform schools in the very ways you've described, of which, of course, you both know a lot about because I think for both of your schools, one a secondary, I know one a primary, but were, were two of the first model schools of, of PLCs in Australia through the All Things PLC um, website. So I'm wondering then, we know the second aspect of this process is so sits around the notion of these three big ideas. And they are a filter for us to think about our work through as we try and implement the professional learning community process, which, of course, in this work is more around about the whole school than it is about a you know, collaborative team. So, you know, if these three big ideas drive the, 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 the process and, you know, the journey that they're on is largely dependent on how we understand these and consider these and embrace them, which is a little bit what we were just talking about with the definition. I'm wondering, again, what your experiences are you know, around this as we move forward on these three big ideas. So I just want to take you through each one and then I just want to get your thoughts on these, again, on your experiences. So if we look at that first big idea of the PLC at Work process, it's that relentless focus on learning. You know, it's the first and the biggest of the big ideas and it's based on that premise that the fundamental purpose of the school is to ensure high levels of learning for all students. You know, it's that why, Janelle, I think that you were talking about. So this focus on and commitment to the learning of each student is at the very essence of a professional learning community. Again, though, I think many people could say, oh, yeah, but that's what we do. I'll come back to that with you both in a moment. So this focus on learning it means that every policy, every practice and all procedures in our school is assessed with these questions. Will doing this lead to higher levels of learning for our students? So in a PLC, we're very focused on making decisions that centre around this question. And secondly, are we willing to revise or you know, discontinue actions that fail to increase student learning? Um, we know that this process is designed to disrupt the status quo of a school deliberately. And so are we willing to revise and you know, discontinue this? So my question to you both around this is, you know, what are the implications for this on schools from your experience? You know, what are the implications of this? 
in terms of, sorry, the I focus on you. learning. Yeah. Sorry. Go, Janelle. No, over to you. I love what you um, I love what you just said then, Gavin, around do these questions underpin every decision that you make? Um, and from my observations, that's one of the reasons where we go wrong and where we get very distracted in schools. And I, I've seen it over multiple schools is where we neglect to go back and put those questions very high in all the decision-making of the school. Um, I think... One of the things for me that has been one of the, the big milestones, I suppose, in the schools I've worked at, particularly I'm at this new school now where you can walk around the school and I, it's just so obvious that the focus is on the teaching, you know, let's get the teaching out, let's get the content out, you know, and it's not a focus on the learning. Um, and I think some of these things are huge cultural shifts and there's a lot of things that then happen in schools, a lot of decisions being made all the time, you know, around, um, pro, you know, just different ways of working in schools. And I have found, honestly, as soon as it, at, at executive level, when you come back to those questions and you put them front and centre on the table, they certainly have a massive impact then on the decision making. I don't know if you found the same, Colin, but I have like straight away, sometimes you can hear a pin drop in those meetings because it causes you to self-reflect and go, oh, well, actually, you know. So, yes, I think they're incredibly important. And, again, I think it takes um, strength and character of a leadership team to actually do that because sometimes it means having to eat a bit of humble pie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Colin? And I would agree with what um, Janelle said there because, to me, the opposite of that first big idea of focus on learning is really a focus on teaching, which is kind of that, you know, idea of we vomit the content on the kids, some will stick, some won't. Traditionally, and that I think was one of those big aha moments when um, my leadership team and the schools I worked with read learning by do, um, doing and really dug down into it. The three big ideas are kind of the fundamental conditions that allow you to actually unpack the definition. Without those three big ideas, you can unpack that definition, but not get the deep understanding of what learning by doing is about. So for me, I know a big aha moment was, and it was no one's fault. I know when I came through my um, training as a, a teacher, it was the fact that I could count myself as a successful teacher if I got through the curriculum. Regardless of whether the kids learnt it or not, I could pat myself on the back, on the back at the end of the year if I could tick off and say I have covered all of the outcomes or all of the goals in the curriculum, I am a successful teacher. So the big shift there is that this is a focus on learning. We don't judge our success by the fact we've taught it. We judge our success by the fact kids have mm. learned it, which ties in with obviously big, uh, big idea number three that you're going to come to. And in both of those questions, Gavin, that you put up that are really, as Janelle has said, those guiding questions we keep coming back to, the first question talked about this, the this. The second question talks about the actions. Well, what is this? What is the actions? And really, when you um, cut down to the chase, we're talking about teaching practice that this is teaching practice. The actions are what teaching practices are having the most impact on student learning. So it is absolutely fundamental because if you do not have teachers who actually understand that they're focusing on, is not on just delivering the content, teaching it, but actually getting kids to master it at the level of proficiency required, then the definition is, you know, is useless. It doesn't change anything. The status quo remains. It's only by that fundamental shift in what our fundamental purpose of teachers is, which is a focus on student learning, that we actually move down the path of becoming a true professional learning community. And it's really interesting um, in a lot of the work I do as a consultant, most people interpret that learning, a focus on learning of student learning, which it ultimately is, mm -hmm. but the pathway to improving student learning has to go back continually to improving teacher learning which is teaching practice mm. awesome so 
in some ways, you're both saying that these three pretty good ideas, in this case, the focus on learning gave you an opportunity to dig deeper, to disrupt that status quo. But you both spoke about from the executive level, from, you know, the middle level, as well as in the classroom. So it has that sort of application running right through the school and has us really think about the difference between a focus on teaching, if you like, um, and a focus on learning, or in Janelle, in your case, even a focus on kind of leadership preference or what we do and a focus on learning, you know, why we're here, which leads us to the next one. And Janelle, you touched on this a little bit earlier, just in your, in your reference to collaboration. But of course, the second big idea is this notion, notion of a focus on collaboration. Now, again, the, this is not new. I know in the work that um, I was part of with the Collaborative Teams Transform Schools book um, with Dr. Robert Mazzano, in the research that Bob did around all of that, you know, this has been around since the, you know, 70s, 1970s, this notion of collaboration and that concept of a professional learning community actually since the 1990s. So when you think about it like that, in learning by doing, it's expressed at a focus on collaboration is important because no single educator has all the time, skills and knowledge to ensure all students learn at high levels. Educators in a PLC commit to working collaboratively to achieve this common outcome. Now, my work in schools across this fantastic country of ours, I could almost say every school could tell me that they work collaboratively. But of course, we know when we dig deeper, it's a bit, it's a bit, there's a bit more to it than that because it's the collaborative team that's the engine that drives the whole PLC community effort, which is the school, and it's the primary building block of the organisation, um, which I think already has us thinking about it in a, in a different way. So in a PLC, collaboration represents this systematic process, as opposed to you know, a group of teachers collaborating, it's a systematic process in which teachers work together interdependently in order to affect their classroom practice. Colin, you just referred to that, in ways that will lead to better results for the students um for their and their team and of course for their school so in you know relation to this my question to you is because there's so much we could talk about and we don't have the time but i wanted to sort of prime the pump enough for us to have this conversation all schools are collaborative to varying degrees and I, I you know i've been so privileged i've worked in you know hundreds and hundreds of schools across this country who all do amazing things i mean educators are such just compassionate well-intentioned amazing human beings and we do work together so how is this different, you know, what this notion of collaboration in the PLC at work process, to you, what stands out as being different to this to potentially what we could kind of pass off as, as, as collaboration because we do work together? Gavin, yeah, if I, I can go first, I just want to build sure. on that point. I would strongly argue that in the Australian context, in particular the Victorian context, which I can talk about in terms of my experience, that collaboration was on the agenda of the uh, Department of Education from the 1990s. I can remember uh, as a, an educator and as a leader in schools, teachers were meeting collaboratively. The problem was, and it's as Janelle mentioned before, they were collaborating, but not necessarily on the right work. It very much became around collaboration was about um, program planning, getting tasks done that didn't necessarily buy into that cycles of learning and action research, which is the fundamental method of improving teaching practice. So I think we can say that in a true PLC and particularly defined as a PLC in a professional learning community at work, the focus of the work must in some way be linked to improving teaching practice. If it isn't, then the focus of the work I would very much doubt is actually the true work of collaborative team in a PLC at work. So I would be saying strongly that many schools are almost fall into that um, seductive idea we're already doing this because we work collaboratively. But the true definition of collaboration in PLC at work focuses on it's about the collaboration that improves our teaching practice. And I think if schools go along with this idea that just by meeting, coming together and completing tasks, if it's not in some organised, systematic way that allows them to actually reflect on what the impact of their teaching is, then you really don't have a true understanding of what a focus on collaboration is in a true PLC. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Janelle, just any thoughts or added thinking around um, oh, Colin's summary there? I, I love that phrase, PLC light, you know, that is often used. And I sometimes think there needs to be a phrase called collaboration light because 
every time I have um, worked with schools or tried or sat in teams, the high performing teams are the ones that have a really in-depth understanding of collaboration, what it takes, what keeps you on track and the depths you need to go to to get that shift in your pedagogy and had a bit of a win. I'll just tell you a little story if that's all right. This um, week we had collaborative teams at our school and um, we've, uh, bear in mind, I've only been there six months. So this has been a huge body of work that we're undertaking. And, you know, of course, there's been some resistors in the groups and all the rest of it. But this week, oh, man, did I leave pumped because these teams it was a, some co collaborative teams across year seven and eight actually that were all meeting and you know there was data on the table there was um some you know we had our pedagogical framework that they had they by choice had put out on the table and were looking at some strategies and they that I sat in this particular team and there was one fellow there who was very anti this six months ago and he was just like really you could just tell he was really hanging on to this collaborative collaborative stuff that the conversations were deep and he turned to me and he said so this is what this is all about and I said yes this is what this is all about I said something that affects your pedagogy and helps you to become a better teacher that's what we're collaborating about and he said well if that's the case I could do more of this so <laughs> I just left and I just went yes <laughs> It was a real win, but it was just something that made me think on reflection afterwards was that he'd he'd become to understand he became to understand that deep collaboration is incredibly productive and incredibly rewarding and motivating. Because it's a, you know, it's affecting it's you. You're talking about you, you know, and I think um when you start to really dig deep into your own practice, it's incredibly motivating. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I guess it goes beyond collaboration, doesn't it? It becomes an understanding of the process that has real relevance and values to, to value to those who are operationalizing that process for what they do every day. Oh, and I think your story kind yeah. of sums that up, you know, in a really nice way. Particularly, um, Gavin, in Queensland, we're a little, I, I kind of feel we're a bit behind the eight ball up here and it's taken us a long time to get where we are as a state, even around all of this stuff. And so, so clear, it's a while to get there, but it's, you know, we're, we're hanging that's why this these sorts of things these webinars and the books and everything we cling on to so much because and listening to you Colin and hearing this stuff that's going on in the other states is is so important because our teachers are so used to working in isolation right so yeah. it's a big yeah thing. no it's interesting that whole more national conversation and how we can enhance collaboration through this lens at that level is also not we haven't got time for that, but it's certainly something that would be useful. So the last, the last um, big idea, of course, is this focus on results. You know, and sometimes I think when I'm working with schools uh, and you know, running some professional learning around this, I often refer to this as like a, a focus on impact because sometimes results is such a loaded term, but we really are talking about you know impact, and we're able to find and we know that impact. We're not just guessing. So a couple of things here in a PLC, we acknowledge that acting on our good intentions to help students is not enough. We must know if our actions are actually leading to higher levels of learning. Again, this is from learning by doing. And a professional learning community purposefully seeks timely, relevant information, like evidence of that student learning that confirms which practices are increasing student learning and which ones are not. I think sometimes that last sentence gets kind of missed because there's, again, in my, my travels across our country, there are most schools that I work with uh, utilizing data to look at student learning. Um, it's pretty rare to come across a school or a team who's not doing that. It is quite the norm now. Um, so it's not that they're not doing that, it's are they doing that to look at the practices in terms of increasing? So when I wondered and prepared for today, I wondered about this question then, how might this differ from your, you know, from how you once thought about a results orientated culture? I thought it might be useful for people to just to listen to your own journey around how you once thought about results, given it's been a huge part of uh, our uh, education system now for quite some time particularly from that collaborative lens to what this um, process kind of demands of us I guess I'm wondering for you um, how does that sit again the biggest aha moment here for um, the teams I have worked with because I agree with um, you Gavin in terms of what you said most schools have some element of data I think particularly nowadays you can't get away from data in terms of it's it's seen as an accountability measure within schools but the data traditionally um, was not used to measure 
the impact of the teaching. It was really a measure of whether kids have learnt it. And there's a, there's a slight difference there because traditionally, it's, you know, the data was have the kids learnt it. Um, if they have, well and good. Um, if they haven't, you know, um, bad luck, we've got to move on. Where I, I feel in a true PLC, the data is, yes, that, but it's also a reflection on, you know, are our practices strong enough for students to learn this? That's what the data should be showing. So it's not only whether the students have learnt it, it's how strong, what impact are we having um, from the, um, the methods we're using in terms of improving student learning. To me, and I think data has got that um, label, you know, if you mentioned data in most schools, teachers roll their eyes because of the way data is used. Um, many schools will say that they're drowning in data. To me, in a true PLC, the learning data we're collecting is really evidence of our impact of our teaching practice. That's what we're looking at. And if we can identify that someone's teaching practice is having a greater impact on the results of their students, well, I'm now curious about what they're doing and what practices they're using because I want to use it in my classroom. I want to go back and be able to capitalise on that. I'm not going to change my teaching practice because someone comes in and says, you should teach this way. But if I have tangible evidence, if there's a results orientation and people aren't scared of sharing results, then there's more going to be this um, continual inquiry into what are the best teaching practices. And if someone's having greater success, I'm now very curious about what they're doing different to me that I might be able to use to the benefit of my students. So I think the shift I'm seeing, and it, it, it's slow and gradual, um, is that data is being more used in the right way rather than it just being for accountability reasons that, you know, we collect this data, but we don't really can't do anything to impact the data because we've already moved on to something else. So in the whole notion of these cycles of learning um, and action research, we're actually using those data to guide where we go next and how we might do it next so that we can have immediate impact on student learning and not going... <gasps> end of another year, we didn't get to where we wanted to get too late, we're moving on because we've now got a new group of kids. Okay, so it's more timely, it's more responsive, and it's more linked to the things that are going to make a bigger difference to the students right now than potentially what we've done before. And I think you've already hinted at it, there's also a need for this safe place for people to be open to looking at data so they can de deprivatise, I guess, their yeah. practice in, in a safe in, environment, which is a whole other topic again, but something that's important. So you've seen that shift. Janelle, what about you? Is that um, from terms of your own journey of how you saw this to how you see it now as, as a result of directly being involved in this work? What's your sense? Um, 100%. I think we have, uh, we've, very much had a culture previously of looking at data through a window, you know, and, and our teachers have definitely been used to that. And I think this whole philosophy challenges leadership, it challenges teachers to look at data with a mirror. And just like you said, Colin, I think when it comes back to what does this mean for me, how can I have an effect on that? Not necessarily that the kid has or hasn't got it. Uh, I, you know, I just find that is a massive shift um, because previously, in my experience, that wasn't the case. So okay. this whole this whole philosophy really puts a light on that, and that's what I'm I'm so passionate about. That I love that aspect, and I think that's actually what teachers jump at. Yeah, um, and I think you was right. Sorry, Gav, I was yes, just going to say, I think yeah. was right there because one of the points that um, I think that just made me think about is that. Teachers work bloody hard. I don't care what anyone says. Um, you know, very rarely, I don't think I ever have, have gone into a school or a classroom where a teacher has kind of in their mind said, I'm going to get the worst results for these kids. Every teacher goes in wanting to do the very, very best. The PLC process and this focus on results actually gives some tangible way of measuring their success. So it actually gives some tangible way of celebrating not only group achievements, but individual achievements of students and teachers in terms of that. So the data should be used as a way of celebrating, you know, the, the gains we're making and improving student learning. And we don't want to just have celebration because we think the kids are learning. We want to have tangible evidence that what we're doing for all our hard work, the teachers slog it out day after day after day, that what they're doing is having the greatest impact. 
not a medium or minimal impact. Mm. So there's again that symbiotic link between a focus on learning and a focus on results is there and the interrelationship between those two ideas. And I think it's really hard to pull those apart because the Mm. focus on learning is very much measured through, you know, this Mm. results orientation that a PLC, a genuine PLC at work must have. Mm. Okay. Well, we're sort of heading down the home straight. I won't keep you too much longer, but I do really appreciate the time that you've given here. Um, Stephen Covey reminds us common sense is not always common practice. You know, um, I get reminded of that all the time. My children normally tell me that it's supposed to be the other way around, but anyway, common sense is not always common practice. And if you look at Pfeiffer and Sutton's work from the knowing doing gap, you know, why does, I've been always very interested in this. Why does knowledge of what needs to be done so frequently fail to result in action or behavior that is consistent with that knowledge? I mean, between the three of us, whether it be the schools we've worked in as, you know, employees, if you like, across the schools we've worked for and, you know, been privileged to do so, seen the varying degrees of take up and impact that this work has had. Um, And so there wouldn't be many educators who don't know what professional learning communities are, or at least haven't heard the term. Um, So my question to you sort of centres more around this knowing doing gap. You know, how can this be overcome? I mean, through this lens, what, what's some of your thinking around how you have um, and how you help people just to overcome the knowing, doing gap? Because going back to your example in the classroom, I don't think it's ever deliberate, um, but it's a difficult thing because we're trying to help schools work towards a model of schooling we've never had and that we were never part of. So it's, it's not easy. Any thoughts you've got just in terms of, you know, how can we overcome this kind of notion of the, the knowing, do, doing gap in this context? Um, I, I think it's a really interesting thing because you're right, it's so true. And I, you know, when you sit and listen sometimes to leadership teams and they're talking about the issues they've had or that they're having, I feel like sometimes as leaders, we neglect to bring our people with us, you know, that this is, this takes a village. This doesn't take a principal who's passionate. It sure it does but it takes a hell of a lot more than that. And I think it's imperative that when you know more, that you work with people and bring your people with you so they know more as well. It's very easy to to do it top down and it won't work top down. You know, it takes a a lot of living the collaboration at every level, Mm -hmm. not just in teacher levels, but living collaboration in your executive team, living collaboration with, if you're in secondary schools, with your leaders of of learning, your heads of department, all of those sorts of things, and continually working on the culture. Because as we know, Mohammed, you know, Anthony Mohammed has said so beautifully, you know, you can bring in all these technical changes, but if you don't have the culture, it will fall flat. Mm -hmm. And the culture, the collaboration to me is the culture that you have to have right for this work. So for me, it's definitely been about being incredibly persistent, but about loving the people you're with, saying love the ones you're with in terms of bring your people with you. Because Mm -hmm. this this philosophy is something that everybody that I've worked with genuinely comes on board with and goes, wow, why didn't I know about this sooner? Yeah, so... so that, I guess that's part of the knowing doing gap, isn't it, Janelle, is that now I know this, but I would have been on the bus sooner. Um, and a key to that you're saying is that notion of flattening the organisation that Bob Mazzano refers to. And there's so many leadership models. I know in our book, Five Ways of Being, we have researched so many leadership models, but distributed leadership, quiet leadership, servant orientated leadership, all these leadership models, they lend itself to this work. And if we can build that through I guess harnessing a more collaborative effort, you're saying we're more likely to be able to overcome that knowing, knowing, doing gap. I think that's a really yeah, important message. Colin, what about for you? Anything that sort of stands out? Yeah, and I think it picks up what Janelle was saying. Um, really, when you boil it down, the PLC at work process is very, very simple. Okay, but it's not easy. It's simple in the fact that it's one definition, three big ideas, and four questions that guide the work. But it's deceptively simple. Mm. So if leadership doesn't have a full grasp and understanding of what it is, what tends to happen in many schools that I've worked with is that it's almost a a handballing and going, this is the work of collaborative teams. We as a leadership team can kind of step back a little bit from this and let 
our collaborative teams take control, which they need to. But as Janelle so um, articulately uh, stated, the leadership team there has to be there supporting them. And often when I'm talking to schools about this, I talk about inverting, you know, the, um, the pyramid. I know when I first became a principal, I very much had a, a pyramid with the point at the top. And I thought that, you know, I could, from my office, issue decrees that would go to my leadership team, that would filter down in the classrooms, and then change would happen in classrooms. With the PLC model, it's actually inverted. I had to realise that there was really no improvements of student learning happening in my office, but it was happening every day in the classrooms. So yeah. the role of the leadership team has to be to serve the work of collaborative teams. So... The whole PLC concept and, you know, Rick DeFore and the other authors are very clear in their model that the PLC is not the collaborative team. The PLC is the whole school. And the why they are so strong about that point is that you cannot devolve responsibility of this down to the teams. Yes, they are absolutely incredibly important because, as you've said, Gavin, they are the work engines of a PLC. But without good oil from the uh, leadership team, those teams soon seize up. Those work engines seize up and stop working. Leadership teams have to be reflective and responsive to the needs of their teams because as they start to do the work, they'll understand more about what the work is and therefore their needs will change. If in a true PLC, if I walked into a true PLC, and their um, staff meetings and the way they ran their leadership team meetings was the same as they were doing five years ago before they became a PLC. I'll go, you're not a PLC because you haven't got the structures in place to nurture the culture, to build the capacity of people to do this work. If PLCs fail at the collaborative team level, then the leadership team should look back and go, we failed at the leadership team level. That's the symbolic relationship of this. Mm, so being, I think what's coming, the thread that's running through both of your responses, one is the critical nature of uh, leadership and within that leadership, cultivating a collaborative culture within themselves and across the school, mm. um, but also this notion of being growth focused in your approaches and through that, then supporting those people who you're asking to do different things in, in, in their work. Uh, and then you, you make real gains. So it's a nice kind of lead in, I guess, to the last sort of part of our webinar here um, before I sort of finish things off. If you had, you know, one hot, I know that's a really hard thing to say, right? Because as you said, this is such deep work, um, you know, and complex work, even though on the outset, it, it seems quite simple. But if you were to give just one tip based on, I guess, the conversation that we've had that you think people who are watching this webinar would say, oh, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing to con consider or to continue to keep in, you know, my consciousness. What would, you, what, would you, what would you say that tip was? Just me, put you on the spot. Sorry, for me, Gav, if I had to go back and I had to kind of try and gel all this down to one tip is I would go schools, leadership, educators need to be led through a process where they have absolutely crystal clear clarity for them what high levels of learning for all students means. If they can focus on um, having a joint understanding, that then leads to everything else that needs to fall over. So if we believe that, believe that's fundamentally possible, then what do we need to do? What do we change in our practice? And what is the best, best method of moving forward with achieving that? That would be my tip. Focus on clarity of understanding of what it means for, for all students at our school to achieve high levels of learning because that so will that, then drive everything else. That fundamental mission that sits at the heart of the PLC at work yep. process is... Because is you're really, and I'll say it, pushing shit uphill. If you're trying this, to create... This was G-rated. It's now moved to M, but anyway. That's and right. people, if people don't fundamentally believe that high levels of learning for all students is, is possible, you're pushing it, it uphill to try and implement a PLC at work process because that's fundamentally what you're trying to do. And if people go, it's impossible to do that, then you're not going to engage them without some work and some real, you know... Um, you know, uh, professional discussions around what this means and what it means for our school and why that might be possible. You're not going to encourage people to go on this journey with you. Okay, thank you. So they, the importance, again, you can hear the passion 
And I know the knowledge that you have, the working knowledge of helping schools to develop that, that clarity uh, in, in the mission um, of high levels of learning for all students, of course, all meaning all, not most. Janelle, what about you? Um, I think for me, it's probably similar, Colin, in that I think that whole clarity word, but being very clear of the end game. What is it that you're really, really trying to do here in honouring that definition and those big ideas? And be really clear about that. Know your end game because then you won't settle for compliance. Don't settle for compliance. Don't even settle for engagement because that's, your, that's a step and that's awesome. But what you really, really want to go for is empowerment. And when you fully understand that definition and when you fully live those big ideas, teams will be empowered and by God, the whole school will feel that. And it is so motivating and it is such an incredible thing to feel when teams operate at that depth. So know your end game, know the steps you might need to take to get there. And there will be implementation dips. 100% where you'll feel like, what the hell am I doing and why is it going so long? But I tell you what, when you're really clear of where you're heading and where you want to get to, it's incredibly exciting when you finally get there. Yeah, nice. So that notion of empowerment, which sits so closely with what you were saying before about collaboration is probably the lever to continuing to develop the commitment, right? Yeah. Um, you know, to this process. So really I think, Gavin, it, it, Sorry, Gav, I was just going to say, I think it brings you back, doesn't it, in terms of what Janelle's just said there, is what's the name of the book? Learning by doing. Yeah, that's so true. That's what it brings you back to, learning by doing. Don't expect to know all the answers up front. You don't need to, because as you progress this journey, if you know what your end point is, what you're aiming for, then, you know, you will get there because you will learn as you do the process. You will take some seductive detours, you'll go off track, but if you are keeping your eye on that end goal of high levels of learning for all, you will eventually get there. And I guess that process yeah. brings the empowerment that you were talking about, Janelle. Sorry, Gavin, I was just going to say another thing is don't be frightened to reach out because there's a network of people who are doing this and, you know, find a Colin, find a Janelle, find people who are working in this space outside of your school and mm -hmm. absolutely harness that knowledge and harness those tips at ground level because, geez, that has made a, mm -hmm. a big difference for me, you know, really just reaching out and going, what do I do now? Where do I head now? You know, mm -hmm. and I think if you can develop those networks, it set, almost helps set you up for success. Yeah, so it's good advice too. Surround yourself by expertise and people you know. I know I've had the privilege of working in both your schools at one point in time, um, which was a joy. And I think for each of us, when we get that opportunity, we learn as well by doing right, um, which is sort of part of that part of that process. So nice way to finish off. I'm just going to revert to this. Obviously, learning by doing. Now, Hawker Brownlow Education have got so many amazing resources, not just people resources. They got that as well, but um, books. Learning by doing. We've talked about. It's been the thread of our webinar tonight. Colin, I just thought I'd put in um, your professional learning community's voices from the field because that's a complete professional resource for schools. And I know what a labour um, of love, I'll say, that was for you. Um, but it's genuinely such a useful resource for those who are leading this process and wanting to build that empowerment and collaboration that, Janelle, you were, you were referring to with real examples. And I think video footage of Australian schools doing this work, I think it was your school. So you've got uh, that part as well. I mean, that's just two, we're just, you know, sort of the tip of the iceberg stuff, really. But please go to um, www.hbe.com and get um, whatever you feel that you might need um, to support you in your, your journey, um, which just leaves me, sorry, I think I went one too far to say thank you both. Thank you so much for um, joining us here. Um, um, it's been a, a just great conversation. We could probably talk about this all night, but we won't. <laughs> I'll let you go. You've volunteered enough of your time already. We appreciate what you do. Thank you so much for what you do for the students that you serve, for the schools you serve, and of course, for the work you do with Hawker Brownlow Education, your, your national treasures. 